Welcome to Touching the Ozarks, the weekly television broadcast ministry of Ozark Full Gospel Church, featuring the Bible teaching of Pastor James Akins. Thank you for joining us and stay tuned as we get ready to hear another message from God's exciting word. Jesus said, when I die for the world, I'm going to the tomb and I'm going to get up from the grave and I'm going to offer salvation to the whole world. And I want you to know for the Christian, the best is yet to come. At Ozark Full Gospel Church, we have three exciting services every week. Our service times are Sunday morning at 10.30, Sunday night at 6 p.m., and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. There is meaningful praise and worship and powerful Bible preaching at every service, and we never close for any reason. In addition, be sure to follow us on social media to stay up to date with all of our upcoming events and most current information. We look forward to seeing you soon, right here where we are touching the Ozarks with Jesus Christ. But we're going to read the first 11 verses. We're going to be talking about some things in our day uh, that clashes with the other day, past days, and we're going to merge it together and see what God would say to us, whether it be encouragement or warning, exhortation, whatever it takes. I mean, no, the book of Jude is intense. It's only 25 verses, but boy, it'll rip you up and tear you apart and then put you back together again at the end. Verse 1, the book of Jude, let's stand. With the reading of God's Word, we're going to read down to verse 11, and then we'll get into the message. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. Now, Jude here is the half-brother of Jesus, and notice he didn't pull the family card out. He said, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. And the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you, I'll take that, and peace, I'll take that, and love, I'll take that. Be multiplied, I'll absolutely take that. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend or fight for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their um, first estate but left their own habitation. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these are filthy dreamers, defiled flesh, the flesh, despise dominion and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee, but these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally, as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. 
I want to use for a subject and draw it from verse 3, the common salvation. But I want, to, I want you to understand that we are not living in common days. And so we're going to be using for a subject this morning, our uncommon days. You may be seated. Our uncommon days. Verse 3 says that Jude is going to, he, he addresses it. He says, I love you, uh, beloved. I, I came intensely with all diligence to write to you about the common salvation. I love the phrase common salvation. I think you can hook that with Acts chapter 10 where God said to Peter, what God has cleansed, call not thou common or unclean. And so I think Jude is referring somewhat to that, that Jesus Christ delivers us and gives us eternal life. And the word common there with the Jews would be Gentiles. And it was needful for me to write unto you, Jude says, and exhort you that you should earnestly fight or contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. Now notice that phrase, was once delivered unto the saints. I want you to understand something that is really important that we recognize this in our day. We are living in a time that's nothing like the 1700s. Nothing like the 1800s. Nothing like the 1900s. In just the past few decades, we have seen deterioration in our land and around the world that is unprecedented. It's biblical proportion. It is a time that we live that is very uncommon. Jude said that this message of salvation in the beginning was common. That doesn't mean it was ordinary. It, it is extraordinary. The gospel of Jesus Christ is extraordinary. But when, it, but when Jude said the common salvation, he simply meant that it was known throughout the world at that time. In other words, it was, people had heard about it. They knew that there was power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. He was showing that God would deliver through his son, and he said, you know about that because it changed your life. Jude was saying, I was going to talk to you about that wonder-working power of the blood of the Lamb just to, you know, stir you up, strengthen you, brace you up. But he said, God moved on me, Jude said. God dealt with me that I needed to take another direction in the book and warn people that your faith is being attacked. Your faith is being attacked by devils, by false prophets, attacked by the world. Your faith is being attacked, and greatly so, in these last few hours of the soon return of Jesus Christ. Hell is not the capital city of the devil. Sometimes I think Moscow is the capital city of the devil right now. God likes to use tyrants, evil men, false prophets, false teachers. The devil likes to use them to destruct people's lives. And so the devil is using a lot of opposition at this time. We are living at a very crossroads. I believe the Lord could come at any moment. I said earlier that this is the worst time possible to be backslid. This is a horrific time to be out of church. This is a very terrifying time for you to not be connected with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is a time that is wasting and a time that is quickly coming to an end. It is the last time, the last days. It is the time in which our Lord could turn, return at any moment for his church. The Lord. But I wonder, just in my heart, I wonder just how much real gospel of Jesus Christ is really being preached, or is there a different Christ being preached? Is there a different gospel being preached? Well, the gospel that I preach is man's a sinner, he's going to hell, 
He's got to repent of his sins. God's got to draw him. He comes to the Lord. Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood for the sins of the world, and washes us in the blood of Jesus Christ. When we repent of our sin, and God takes up residence in us and possesses us by the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, and God sanctifies us, fills us, touches us, keeps us, unto the coming of Jesus Christ. And that Jesus not only died on that cross, that bloody cross, he was put in that bloody tomb, but Jesus Christ come up out of the graveyard, out of the tomb, resurrected, sovereign God of the universe. King of kings and Lord of lords. Woo! Did, if you didn't shout right there, you were asleep. Hey, wake up, shout. Now, he talks about the common salvation, and, you know, people are drifting from that. They're getting away from that. They're almost long gone. It's a different type of setting in our day. Everything is turned upside down. Everything is taught wrong, and the truth is being attacked on every hand. The truth is being attacked in our schools. It's being attacked in our government. The truth is being attacked in politics. The truth is being attacked even in many churches today. But I'll remind you that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. I read an article some years ago about a preacher by the name of William Booth. Now that may not ring a bell with you, but this will because they ring a bell every Christmas time. Salvation Army. William, they called him General William Booth. He's the founder of Salvation Army. Now, Salvation Army is not too much of an army or salvation right now, but at one time it was a, thr a thriving, powerful move of God. And William Booth, in the late 1800s, the very late 1800s, when, you know, the Bible was being preached... When people were being saved by the masses, when the homosexual was still in their closet, when abortion was hidden, when sins was, was hidden and not blatant in front of people's faces, when people were embarrassed to be in adultery or embarrassed to live in fornication, a time when sin was embarrassing and condemning, a time when the gospel of Jesus Christ was so powerfully preached in the days, the early 1900s, and the late 1900s, the late 1800s is when William Booth spoke these words. William Booth, the founder of Salvation Army, uh, Army in the late 1800s said, my chief fear and the chief dangers that are coming in the future are as follows. He said, religion without the Holy Ghost. Christianity without Christ. Forgiveness without repentance. Salvation without regeneration. Politics without the true God. And heaven without a hell. Well, we're there, Brother William Booth. We are there, and I am embarrassed that we are there. I am troubled that we are there because we are living in uncommon days. It now is approaching the days of Noah. We are rapidly coming to the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Jude says, I need to warn you and tell you to fight for the faith, to stand for the faith. And then in this book of Jude, he talks about false teachers. We said last Sunday uh, morning in the first uh, series uh, message of Jude was that false teachers were called ungodly, dreamers, spots among us, fruitless trees, waterless clouds, raging waves of the sea, wandering stars. And in verse 13, they are going to hell. Basically what? Jude was saying, you don't hear that very often. You're going to hell. 
I don't say that with pleasure. But hell is not the capital city of the devil. The devil rages in the cities of our nation. I believe that Satan's seat very well could be in the area of Moscow at this time. We very well could be moving toward a great World War III. If it doesn't happen, it will. If it doesn't take place in the near future, it will come to pass. If we escape World War III at this moment in the next few years or so, then rest assured it'll come again. And Jesus Christ said very clearly, in the world there'll be wars and rumors of wars. And he said, when there's wars and rumors of war, you know that we are approaching the coming of the return of Jesus Christ. Now, Jude gives us three illustrations of some people who fail. There are, he gives us illustrations of some who fail, fell away from the faith, fell away from the things of God. And the first illustration he gives us is in verse 5. It is the illustration of those who fell and died in the wilderness. Remember? Verse 5 says, I therefore will put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, in other words, God brought them out of uh, Pharaoh, Egyptian bondage, after they were brought into the wilderness, it says, afterward destroyed them that believed not. In other words, in the wilderness is where the children of God complained and murmured. In the wilderness is where they forgot God's power as he brought them through the Red Sea on dry ground. In the wilderness is when they complained about angel food and the manna from heaven. In the wilderness is where they became discontent, angry at Moses, angry at God. In the wilderness is where the children of Israel begin to worship a golden calf. In the wilderness is where people begin to rebel against Moses, begin to reject the law of God that came from Mount Sinai. In the wilderness is people who got fearful and afraid of their surroundings. They stopped listening to God and started listening to the voices of those that were fearful and afraid. That's happening today, by the way. I've seen it so many times. People go through, and we are in a wilderness. How many would agree that we are in a wilderness? This world is a wilderness. A wilderness of famine, a wilderness of forsaking the word of God, a wilderness for a famine of hearing the word of God, a wilderness of sickness and disease, a wilderness of pain and sorrow, a wilderness of uh, uh, satanic attacks, a wilderness of oppression and depression and obsession of wickedness and evil. This is a wilderness. Thank God we can follow the shepherd and we can look to Jesus Christ because as long as we stay with the shepherd, we will not be the sheep that's lost in the wilderness. As long as we stay with Jesus Christ, we will not be lost in the world, but not of the world. Going to the wilderness, but we shall survive because Jesus is our oasis of life. Jesus is our water of life. Jesus is our bread, our manna, our hope, our life, our strength, our shepherd. We going to the wilderness many times get discouraged. We get weak. Amen. And when the children of Israel finally arrived to the Jordan River, about to go across on full flooded harvest time, uh, Jordan was full. And God had told to Moses and Joshua Light, Passover, take the land of milk and honey. Now we need to remember something. If you're going to live in the land of milk and honey, you've got to milk the cows and fight the bees. We want the milk, but we don't want to milk the cow. We want the honey, but we don't want squeezed. And we don't want stung. But the children of Israel, as they sent 12 spies over, and by the way, they sent, all they needed to send is them too. 
Caleb and Joshua. The other flaked out. They were, we can't do it. They saw giants in the land. Oh, they saw a runny nose, coughing, slobbering, blundering giants in the land. They saw giants in the land that thought that they were unbeatable. The sons of Anak. And they're going into the the spies as they looked over Canaan. Caleb and Joshua came back and said, we can take them. God's bigger than the giants. We can take Jericho. God's taller than the walls of Jericho. We can win the battle. Let's go. But the other spies said, I, 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 hold on just a minute. Whoa, wait, 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 hold back. Those 10 spies called NATO says, we can't go in there. We're afraid. Well, you didn't like what I said. Strike that from the record. (laughs) We're afraid. And God says, you're afraid? I brought you across the Red Sea. God said to the masses, I said, we can't take the city. There's giants over there. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. We can't go in there and win. There's no way we can do it. And God says to them that were given a bad report, says, do you not trust me? I fed you manna. I gave you water to drink. I brought you across the Red Sea. I gave you deliverance from Pharaoh. I've taken care of you through the wilderness. I've watched over you through all this time. And you're telling me that you're afraid? The God of Israel that conquers everything and you're telling me you're afraid? The God who created the heavens and the earth and the God who hung the stars, the moon and the stars, and the beauty of all creation, and they're telling him, I'm afraid. The God who brought miracle after miracle, the manna, the quail, the water, the blessings, the conquering of enemies in in the wilderness, and you're telling me you're afraid? Well, that angered God. And God said, and they said, well, we're afraid our children ain't going to make it. We're afraid they're going to get hurt if we go across the border, go across Jordan. And God said, children, you're afraid? You've got me, but you're afraid because you're afraid the children are going to get hurt? You liars. You're just a coward. And God says, because of that, I'm going to let all of you old people from 20 years and up die and rot in the wilderness because you don't trust me. And the children were the ones that possessed the land. Isn't that good? Don't don't ever make your children an excuse to be a coward. Don't ever make your past an excuse to be a coward. We've got a big God that can take us through. Amen? So, boy, this preaching is kind of salty this morning. Well... You should eat more sugar before you came. But Jude says some fell in the wilderness. And it was a lot. It was a generation that fell in the wilderness. Because they would not trust God. And we too are in a wilderness. And we're going to have to learn to trust God. We're going to have to learn to believe God. So a preacher sometimes I doubt. Everybody doubts. Everybody doubts. Preacher, do you doubt? I said everybody doubts. Don't make me talk any longer about that. Everybody doubts. Everybody has a hard time. Everybody has their moments of downtime. Everybody has their moments of hard time. That doesn't make you abnormal or less of a Christian. It just makes you a normal Christian like the rest of us who needs an abnormal, supernatural Savior called Jesus Christ. So don't feel like you're not, don't feel like, don't feel like, well, I'm just not like others. Yes, you are. You're like everybody else. You struggle, I struggle. Everybody in this room struggles. You say, well, I don't believe you struggle. I don't believe others struggle. Well, why do you think I'm preaching? Why do you think the book of Jude was written? Because people struggle. But we've got God to take us through our struggles into the promised land. Amen. Then Jude gives us 
the second group of people who fell. And these are not people people. These are angels. And I want to call this, the first one I called the wilderness. The second one I want to call the highest deception of all. Verse 6. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. That means they left heaven. He, God, is reserved in everlasting change under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Jude says, you better buckle down, you better hold tight, you better stand, and you better hold strong. I realize things are hard for you. I realize the wilderness is hard for you. I realize the wilderness is, is, uh, is terrible for you. But I remind you there were some angels of the highest deception that they did not know a problem in the world. They did not know a trouble in the world. They were with God. They were in heaven. There's no sickness in the angel's uh, angelic body. There's no sickness in the angel. There's no, there's no wilderness for the angel. There's no lack of strength and lack of power for the angels. Yet the angels being in heaven, the highest deception of all came upon the angels. And the 12th chapter of Revelation says that the devil, the dragon drew one third of the angels, the stars out of heaven when Lucifer fell. And Lucifer that bright and shining uh, cherub, that music uh, 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 pipe organ, a worshiper of God who was the most beautiful creature God ever made. We're talking about Lucifer got filled with pride and said, hey, I can be God. I can ascend to the north. I can uh, sit uh, at the north and be like the most high God. I can do it. And he started a rebellion among the angels in heaven. Listen, if you can if, if the angels can fall out of heaven where God is there, if the angels can fall out of heaven where no problem is there, if the angels can fall out of heaven when there's no sickness and no despair there if the angels can fall out of heaven when there is no obstacles there let me tell you friends right now warning warning you can fall in the wilderness angels the highest deception angels fell you say, well, how did they fall? Well, the Bible says they, they are reserved in the everlasting change under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. In other words, some of these angels were so, well, some of these angels ticked God off so much that God just put them in the darkness. Some of these angels were so rebellious and so horrific that God says, okay, that's, that's enough. You're going to be in darkness and change of outer darkness until the judgment day. You're through. You're finished. I believe that some of these angels will be le loosed out of the bottomless pit in Revelation. Some of these angels that are bound under the great day of judgment, and by the way, the great tribulation is the great day of judgment. Some of these uh, horrific angels will come out of the pit and the giants will return just before the return of Jesus Christ in the second coming. They were giants in the land in, in uh, the days before Noah, and they'll be giants in the land the days before Jesus returns to planet Earth. Now, let me give you something to chew on. Some people think, well, these angels, when they came down, well, let me, let me read it to you. In, in Genesis 6, verse 4, before the flood, when the angels came down, notice that there were giants in the earth in those days, days of Noah. And also after that, when the sons of God, now people believe the sons of God here is the, the uh, uh, Sethites, the sons of Seth, came under the daughters of men, and some people believe the daughters of men is Canaan or Can Canaanites, the beautiful sinful women of Cain, and they bore, they bore children or bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Now, some people will say, well, the sons of God here is angels. Others will say the daughters of men is men, obviously. Some will argue the fact that the sons of God is the Sethites, the children of Seth. Others will argue that the the, the daughters of men is the Cain, Canaanites. Now, 
I want you to understand there's nothing said about the daughters of men here in Jude. There's nothing said about the sons of God here in the sixth verse, at least, in Jude. But verse 7 leads me to believe that there was some kind of perversion with these angels, with mankind. And without me going into a lot of details, after the flood, all the giants were destroyed. But in the genetics of Noah or his sons, Shem, Ham, or Japheth, there was some kind of mutation that produced giants in the land in which David killed one of them called Goliath. There were giants in the land who had six toes on each foot. There were giants in the land. So there was a mutation physically. Someone said, well, why was there giants in the days of Noah? You could argue the fact that there was the canopy theory. In other words, the earth was surrounded by water. When you looked up at the sky, it was water. And, and if you looked at the sky, it wouldn't be blue, it'd be pink before the flood. And that when God caused the flood to come, he ripped the canopy apart. Torrents of rain began to come up on the earth. God broke the, the, the deep of the crust of the earth. Water gushed up from beneath the earth. Water gushed down from above the earth. And there was a great deluge of flood bringing an instant freeze to the South Pole and the North Pole. Explain why dinosaurs and mammoths are frozen to death with grass still in their mouth. Now, I don't know about you, but even a dinosaur's got enough sense to know if he's about to die to not be chewing his cud. Hello? Come on now. I'm preaching better than you respond. You say, well, I don't believe in that canopy theory. Well, you can believe what you want to. I really don't. You know, it's, I'm just sharing. I'm just sharing. I'm just preaching and, and giving you something to think about. Are these sons of God, Sethites? Are the daughters of men Canaanite women? Maybe. Did the, did the angels have sexual relationship with the daughters of men? I don't know how you could define sex with an angel. I don't know their genetic composure. I don't know how they're built. And so the angels, I don't know what kind of mutation they were. I don't know what they're made out of. I don't know. I, I do know Jesus Christ said, when you die, we'll be like the angels in heaven, neither married nor given in marriage. You say, uh, some of you were thinking about that scripture just now when I mentioned it, that Jesus said, they'll be like the angels um, in heaven, not uh, being married nor given in marriage. But... That's kind of a, a vague description that Jesus gives us about the angels not being married or not given in marriage. That's a kind of a vague description. Now, I don't know the deception between the angel having sex with the daughters of men. I, 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 what, define that sex for me. Could there be something to do with Knowledge and, and, and um, interaction between demons with people involved in things? I think so. I don't think there'd have been a Hitler without a fallen angel by his side. I don't think there would be a Putin without a demon in his life. I don't believe someone would leave their wife or their husband and fall into an adulterous affair unless there's a demon involved. You see, the thing is, the, the web, the phone, the things that God, the devil will use them to bring you into a web and use them to bring you into a great deception. And in the end time, the banks will have so much authority that they will control your life. The cell phone. 
the electronics will control your life. Deception. I never got into them games where they fight, you know, and they have war games on the computer. I don't even know what they call them. And just weird stuff. I, I was going on the computer and watched some weird thing. Looked like a, you know, not a human, but a computer animation, some kind of a robot or something fighting somebody else, and I'm thinking, and and the guy took his, took grabbed that guy and cut his head off, and blood just went everywhere, and I'm thinking, does people watch that stuff? Does people play that stuff? Does people get on the cell phone and talk for hours upon hours and ends on end? Does people actually communicate with people they know nothing about hours and hours upon end? God caught in the web, got caught in the net, being deceived. Is it possible that we're living in a day now that the whole world is falling into a deception? As God said, I'll send them a strong delusion that they will believe a lie. And they will line up for their mark. They'll line up for their number. They'll line up for their, 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 their uh, like, like, you know, like robots before the government. They'll line up in submission because well, they got to work and they got to eat. It's all demonic. It's all coming to a town near you. It's all coming to a city near you. Is a cell phone wrong? No. Is a is a computer wrong? No. Is is a is talking to people over the web wrong? No. Is 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 a is the technology wrong? No. Is the bank going to the bank wrong? Is the credit card, is the debit card wrong? No, 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 no. All good things. But remember, it was the devil that deceived Cain over an offering at the altar. It was the devil that deceived the angels into thinking that they could mutinize or go, come against God and they could usurp authority over God in the rebellion and they were cast down by God Almighty. And so we are living in very satanic times, uncommon times. Amen? I see right now I'm not going to get through all of this. We'll pick it up next week. But let me come to the last one. It all share. Some fell. Some fell in the wilderness. Some fell to the highest deception angels. Some are going to fall to that deception in the future. Technology, whatever, the mingling of whatever satanic is coming. But I want to talk about the most deceiving sins. The most deceiving sins. You see, the most deceiving sin is for you to think that you can still live the way you're living and God is okay with it. The most deceiving sin is for you to be caught up in some kind of immoral act or immoral sin and make it approved or say it is approved of God or twist the scriptures, twist the truth to say, I was born that way or I am that way or you know, God understands and I'm different. Sin the most deceptive sin is not, and I'm not going to name sins here, but the most deceptive sin is when you say, mine's okay, God approves of it, God's okay with it, God will be okay with it, I'm all right. They're deceived. You're deceived if you feel that way. Now, let me go on, the, let me go on the, uh, the, the third one, the most deceiving sins. Verse 7, even at Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. You know what strange flesh is? Well, strange flesh is not angels because angels are not flesh. Strange flesh is sodomy with, with animals. Strange flesh is sodomy with a man with a man or a woman with a woman. That's strange flesh. Your flesh is acting strange. When those men wanted to have sex with those angels, that was strange in the fall of Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, the cities about them in manner, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example 
suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You know what's strange? That what's strange is when you redefine marriages between a man and a woman to mean marriages between two people. What's strange is when you say you were born that way, so it's okay to be attracted to the same sex. I got news for you, sweetheart. You were born worse than that. You were born an absolute reprobate, separated from God Almighty. You were born a murderer. You were born a lunatic. You were born a, 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 a God hater. You were born a sinner. You were born a homosexual. You were born a lesbian. You were born an a ungodly person. You were born any sin, any sin that a man has ever committed, you can commit the same sin under the deception that Satan brings into your life. You might think, well, I'll never do that sin. Everybody in this room could commit any sin that any man or woman has ever committed in the history of mankind because sin is deceptive. Is anybody following me today? The most deceiving sins is not so much we're going to name them. It's that when you're deceived into thinking that you can go to heaven and still have that sin. Or you can, that sin will be understood by the Supreme Court. That sin will be understood by the lawmakers in Washington, D.C. That sin will be understood because we will be temperate and we will be tolerant and we will not be Haters, and we will not be anta antagonistic. We will not be be uh, uh, haters and 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 uh, uh, hate mongers. The world wants to call us that. Let me tell you what. I whatever your sin is, if it's murder, stay away from me. But you're welcome to church. Whatever your sin is, if you go down to Walmart and you shoplift every Saturday night. Don't come and tell me. I can't resolve your sin. Go to Walmart and confess it, and they'll throw you in jail. But anyway, whatever your sin is, if your sin's getting absolutely drunk and polluted on Saturday night, and you sit in this church today thinking it's okay because grace, I tell you, friends, they have turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. People say, well, I can drink because of the grace of God. I can commit adultery because of the grace of God. I can, I can smoke drugs and drink drugs and eat drugs and, and be a drug because of the grace of God. That's, that's called grace abuse. And that is defying the true meaning of grace. The true meaning of grace is God will pick you up when you've fallen flat on your face, love you, and bring you back to holiness in the sight of the Lord. That's what grace is. Grace is a power that forgives, that releases, that gives you power to stand up and love God, and God will make you holy and pure again. And nothing is beyond God's forgiveness. Nothing is beyond God's mercy. The grace of God is there for you, but you can't use it as an excuse to say, well, God loves me, so I can commit adultery. God loves me, so I can be a homosexual. God loves me, so I can be a drug addict. God loves me, so I can, I can go to church now and then because of the grace of God. Listen, you are a grace abuser. I'm looking across this crowd, and I know what you're thinking. Preacher, are you going to? Find your way out of what you've just said. Don't want out. It makes no difference whether you're a murderer, whether you're a drunk, an alcoholic. You're welcome to this church. Makes no difference whether uh, whatever you are, if, you're, if you've been sinning, and you're welcome in this church. And, and we're not going to condemn you in the foyer. And we're not going to tell you at the door you're not welcome. And we're not going to go off and gossip and badmouth you behind your back. If you do, you're not part of our church. I don't claim you. You can claim to be part of the church, but I don't claim you. Nobody has the right to leave this church and condemn another for their sins. You are just as sinful in different areas. And so if someone comes into this church as a homosexual, a lesbian, as an adulterer, a fornicator, a drug addict, a drunk, 
we're not here to judge you. We're here to love you. We're here to help you. We're here not to accept your sin, but, but to accept you. We're here to be your friend. We're here to love you. We're here to present the gospel of Christ to you. But we are not here to lie to you and tell you your sin is okay. We're not, I respect you enough to tell you the truth. Everybody can come to this church, whatever their sin is, we love you, we'll respect you, we won't talk about you behind your back. But when I get up on, uh, when I get up uh, behind this pulpit, when I get up to be, preach the word of God, I'm on holy ground and I am not gonna pull back not one fraction of an inch from the word of God. I'm gonna preach the truth. Now I may come down from this pulpit a little bit weak and timid, but you better stay off the platform if you wanna fight with me right now because the adrenaline is moving. Woo! We're gonna talk about that a little bit tonight in the book of Acts, the last few verses of chapter 13. But hear me, I respect you enough to tell you it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. I respect you enough to tell you you cannot be a drunkard and enter the kingdom of God. I respect you enough to tell you you cannot be a Christian bank robber. You cannot be a Christian shoplifter. You cannot be a Christian murderer. You cannot be a Christian abortionist. You cannot be a Christian, a, a, a Christian homosexual. You're a Christian or you're not a Christian. You're, a, you're not a Christian or you're a Christian. There's no in between. This book is a straight line and there is no compromise in this book. So I just want to go on record. I'm not a hate speech person. But I'll preach this book, and if you interpret it as hate, then you're just going to have to interpret that way because this book, I'm not going to be prideful and give people a hard time and try to use this book to beat people up. That's called evangelistic muggins, and I'm not into that. When I was younger, I was, but I'm not into it now. Nothing more enjoyable when I was a young man, run someone down, just beat them with the word of God. Whack, whack, whack. And then I grew up in the Lord and said, that ain't how you win people to Jesus. You preach the truth in love and then grace. And so Jude gives us three examples of how people fell. They fell in the wilderness. Even after seeing God's miraculous power, they fell because they grumbled, they, they, they complained. Angels fell even in the greatest conditions out of pride and rebellion to God. They mingled themselves with man, trying to pervert and bring shame to you and I that have been made in the image of God. God loves us, so the devil wants to hurt us, not just to hurt us, but the devil wants to hurt us because he knows if he hurts us, he'll hurt God because God loves us. And, and, and that's the worst of hate. Amen. And then the deceiving sins. There's people that are caught up in deceiving sins. I, I'm out of time, but I, I intended to preach on uh, the, the way of Cain and the heir of Balaam and, and the rebellion of Korah. I guess we'll be in that next Sunday morning. And woo, it's going to, you say, I thought this morning was hot. Next Sunday, hot, 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 hot. Bring your pot holders. We're, hello. Next Sunday morning, bring a pot holder with your Bible. You're going to need it. Woo, praise the Lord. Just, you say, what are you doing? I'm relieving pressure. Woo, praise the Lord. Now, I don't know all about your life, but I do know this. We are living in an unprecedented time. We are living in a time that is 
uncommon. And the giants are returning. And the angels are going to be released that have, that have fallen and left their first estate and in chains of darkness forever, for eternity, till the day of judgment. Those angels are going to be released. We're living in a time when demons are going to come out everywhere. A time of black magic, a time of sorcery, a time of witchcraft, a time of satanic evil will begin to invade the land. So well, how did it begin? It began with politicians. But anyway, hello. It's not the common man that God, that the devil's going to use to destroy America. It's not the common man that the devil's going to use to destroy our world. It is the politician. It is the hierarchy. It is the dictators. It is the controlling ones that want to control. And in the process of controlling their victims, their victims are killed and innocent people are destroyed because of evil leaders. Amen. We're right there. We're right there. We're, we're just about to hear the call. Amen. The Bible says the Lord himself self will, will descend from heaven with a shout. The voice of an archangel, the trump of God. I, I used to tell people, the Lord's going to descend from heaven with a shout. And then he'll talk angel language. The voice of an angel. The voice of the angel of God. And then he'll say for you that's really deaf of hearing, the trump of God. Because the dead in Christ are really deaf of hearing. The trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive remain shall be caught up in the clouds and meet the Lord in there, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. See, you read that fast, that didn't mean anything. Okay. The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a whoo shout, the voice of an archangel and the doo -doo 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 trumpet of God. And we'll be caught up, caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And we'll say, hello, Jesus, bye-bye world. And the politicians, when we're gone, will say, I'm sure glad they're gone. Now we can have the whole planet. Well, help yourself. I'm not wanting the planet. I'm wanting heaven. I'm wanting Jesus. It's all that matters to me. Stand with me. We're getting an invitation. If there's a sin in your life right now, you're not safe if you're making excuses for it. If there's a sin in your life right now, you are not going to heaven because you're making excuses for it. If there is a sin in your life, you're deceived. If you continue to commit that sin, continue to live in that sin. Now, I'm not saying we won't sin. We do sin. And God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. I'm talking about rebellious people that they're going to they're gonna sin and you're going to make excuses. And you're going to you say, I don't like this sermon today. Well, you can go find a church that won't talk about your, your sin. You're go, you go find someone that won't talk about your sin. But it's going to be a boring service. You say, well, I like them churches where you give a hundred, give a thousand, miracles come, and glory of God. Come. Yeah, we're going to talk about them in the weeks to come. They're called filthy dreamers. Waves and foaming waves and clouds without water, trees without fruit. And we're going to get into them later. You'll need to bring two pot holders for that one. I have no ill to anybody in this room if you have sin in your life, but I do want to say this. That sin needs to be brought to Jesus Christ. And not only does that sin need to be brought to Jesus Christ, that sin needs to be forsaken. And if you can't break it, God will break it for you. And if you can't help it yourself, 
If you can't, if you can't slap yourself and slap some sense into yourself. By the way, uncommon days like we have just need some common sense. And the preaching today was common sense. And if you can't slap some sense into your life right now, come up here. I'll slap some into you. I shouldn't say that because someone said, well, that's hate speech. No, it ain't hate speech. I'd love to slap the sin out of most of you. Amen? Love to. Altar's open. You come. Josh going to play and sing. Josh needs to just take over because I'm, I'm rambling now. Amen. Now watch next Sunday people will show up with potholders. That's okay. We'll have what we call a potholder revival. Hey, I just came up with a good sword. Potholder revival. Woo! Amen. Altar's open. Is thy heart right with God? Count this down. Listen, there, things listen there's Jesus, nothing wrong with a debit card, a credit card. There's nothing wrong with the cell phone. Nothing wrong with the web. Just remember that Satan's going to turn that on us. And he's going to use it to control the world. The banks are going to become so powerful. The banks are going to become so powerful. Government is going to become so powerful. That we are going to be in a place where the world will be sent a strong delusion to believe a lie. If you missed any of today's broadcast, would like to watch it again, or maybe share it with your friends, you can do that easily by heading over to our YouTube channel. Simply go to www.youtube.com forward slash Ozark School Gospel Church. You'll find today's broadcast as well as many other great messages. While you're there, be sure to click that red subscribe button to stay up to date with all of our latest videos. It's totally free and a great way to stay connected with us.